This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Good evening. My name is my name is Marcia Landl. I'm uh, the dean of the graduate school here at the University of Washington, and on behalf of the graduate school and the whole university, it's really a pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. This is a wonderful crowd of people who've uh, come to tonight's dance lecture. Um, we are here tonight because of a very generous gift that was given to the University of Washington a number of years ago. This lectureship and visiting professorship program was created in 1961 with a bequest from the estate of Mr. John Dance. In 1969, an additional gift was made from the estate of Mrs. John Dance. The purpose of the endowment that they gave was to bring to the University of Washington and to the citizens of this region uh, distinguished lecturers and scholars and authorities of international reputation. If you read the language of the bequest, the dance is particularly wanted to bring people who have concerned themselves, I'm quoting now, who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Uh, I think you will agree with me that the gift of the Dance family was a far-sighted one and one that has really enriched this campus and this community for the over 30 years. Um, I'm very pleased tonight that we have a few members of the Dance family with us. Um, if they would raise their hand or not, uh, perhaps you would join me in thanking uh, their <laughs> relatives. Um, before we proceed with the program, there are a couple of people that I would like to acknowledge. Um, every year we make a call for nominations, both for the dance lectureship and for the Walker Ames lectureship. And we invariably get more nominations of outstanding candidates than we can accommodate. And the really tough job of choosing which of the nominees to bring to this campus falls to the dance and Walker Ames selection committee. Uh, this is a large committee. I won't acknowledge all of the members, but I would sp uh, particularly like to acknowledge the co-chairs, Professor Michael Halloran, who is here. Michael is the Divisional Dean for Arts and Humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Professor Gerald Baldesty. I'm not sure if Jerry's here tonight or not, but Jerry is a professor in the School of Communications. In addition to the selection committee, Another person who works very hard on all of these lectures is Janet Jones, who is the lectureship coordinator and a member of the staff of the graduate school. Uh, Janet is standing here at the front of the auditorium. Uh, these are very tough jobs, a lot of scheduling, a lot of logistics, and she always manages to do it with considerable grace and uh, keep her cool when uh, things start going crazy. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Richard Dawkins, is going to be introduced to you by a distinguished member of the University of Washington faculty. Professor Eric Smith received his master's and doctoral degrees in anthropology from Cornell University. In 1980, he joined the faculty of the University of Washington Department of Anthropology and has risen through the academic ranks to the rank of full professor. In addition to his academic duties, he currently serves as the director of the university's graduate program in environmental anthropology and is part of our new program on the environment. Dr. Smith's broad area of research is evolutionary and ecological theory. Uh, he is particularly well known for his work in foraging and reproductive strategies of indigenous peoples and also for his work on economic models and decision theory. Uh, Dr. Smith is the author of four books, books 
uh, as well as the author of numerous articles, reviews, and commentaries. So please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Smith. Thank you, Marcia. I'm going to try to be quite brief because I think uh, most of you probably came here not to hear me introduce our speaker or for me to be introduced, but to hear Richard Dawkins. Um, he was trained in zoology at, at Oxford University, uh, studied under Nico Tinbergen. And um, other than a brief foray in the States, he's uh, taught at Oxford uh, all of his professional life. Uh, he is currently the first holder of the Charles Simonyi Chair in Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. Um, Dawkins' first book, uh, The Selfish Gene, which came out in 1976 and then in second edition in 89, uh, is still read and used um, in teaching today. Um, and it accomplished, as many of his other books have done, the amazing feat of both educating um, lay readers about some very difficult uh, concepts in evolutionary theory and um, changing the way professional biologists look at their subject. Um, he's followed that book with a series of widely read um, and admired books such as The Blind Matchmaker, uh, Watchmaker, sorry about that. <laughs> Must be the... That's a, a Darwinian slip, not a Freudian one, I think. Um, the Extended Phenotype, um, Rivers Out of Eden, Climbing Mount Improbable, which I think is his latest, although it's hard to keep track, they come out fast and furious. Um, and these books, plus a series of uh, prominent invited lectures, including, um, I just found out, or just verified, a uh, dance lecture in 1979 as part of a quartet of evolutionary biologists. Um, these works and lectures have made Dawkins I think the most widely influential evolutionary biologist alive today. Um, if Thomas Huxley, the eminent 19th century uh, biologist and confidant of Darwin, uh, was Darwin's bulldog, as he was known at the time, it might be fair to say that Dawkins has become evolutionary biology's bulldog. Um, I'll wager, in any case, that among all the honors uh, that he's accumulated, he's the only one uh, around who has both debated the Archbishop of York and appeared on the cover of Wired magazine. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard Dawkins, who is going to speak to us tonight on a lecture entitled Science and Sensibility. It is a great honor to be invited to give the Jesse and John Dance lecture uh, for the second time, and I really feel that honor keenly. I gave it once before as part of a quartet, and now to give it on my own, uh, I'm very honored. The century that's about to end, <laughs> not quite that soon, I hope, The century that's about to end could be called, from a scientist's point of view, the golden century. <laughs> More scientists are working today than in all other centuries combined. Although I have to add that, to put that figure into frightening perspective, more people are alive today than have died since the beginning of recorded history. But it's not just a question of quantity. The 20th century is the century of Einstein and relativity, of Planck, Heisenberg, and quantum theory, of Watson, Crick, Sanger, and molecular biology, of Turing, von Neumann, and the computer, of Wiener and cybernetics, of plate tectonics and radioactive dating of the rocks, of Hubble's redshift and the Hubble telescope, of penicillin, of moon landings, and let's not duck the issue of the hydrogen bomb. 
My title is Science and Sensibility. And of the various meanings of sensibility given in the dictionary, I mean discernment, awareness, and the capacity for responding to aesthetic stimuli. One might have hoped, but by the, the end of the 20th century, the scientific attitude would have been incorporated into our culture, that it would have made us more discerning and more aware than in previous centuries, and that our aesthetic sense would have risen to meet the poetry of science. Without wanting to recall the mid-century pessimism of C.P. Snow, I reluctantly find that with only two years to go, these hopes have not been realized. Astrology sells more books than astronomy. Television producers and commissioning editors more than ever beat a path to the door of second-rate conjurers masquerading as psychics and clairvoyants. Cult leaders mine the millennium and find rich seams of gullibility. Heaven's Gate, Waco, poison gas in the Tokyo underground. The biggest difference from the last millennium is that folk science fiction has replaced folk Christianity. It should have been so different. The last millennium, there was some excuse for superstition. Then we knew almost nothing by comparison. When Halley's Comet appeared in 1066, people could be pardoned for seeing it as a harbinger of Hastings, sealing Harold's fate and Duke William's victory. Hale Bopp in 1997 is less pardonable. I find it really, there's real pathos in the gratitude that I felt towards the newspaper astrologer who was good enough to reassure his readers that Hale Bopp was not directly responsible for Princess Diana's death. <laughs> but what is going on when 39 people, inspired by a theology compounded of Star Trek and the Book of Revelations in equal measure, commit collective suicide, neatly dressed in suits and with overnight bags packed by their sides, because they all believe that Hale Bopp was accompanied by a spaceship come to, quote, raise them to a new plane of existence. Hijacking by pseudoscientists is not the only threat. Populist dumbing down of science is another. The public understanding of science movement, provoked in America by Sputnik and in Britain by falling uh, uh, recruitment to universities to read science. The public understanding of science movement is going demotic. A spate of science weeks and science fortnights betrays a near desperate need of scientists to be loved. Funny hats and larky voices proclaim that science is fun, fun, fun. Wacky personalities perform explosions and funky tricks. I attended in Britain recently a, a forum in which a, uh, somebody who was in, involved in this movement was urging us to put on events in shopping malls and his advice was to do nothing that might conceivably be interpreted as a turn-off. Always make your science relevant to ordinary people's lives, to what goes on in their own kitchen and bathroom. If possible, choose your experimental materials so that your audience can eat them at the end. <laughs> at the last event organized by the speaker, the scientific phenomenon that really grabbed attention was the flushing mechanism that came on automatically as you stepped away from the urinal. <laughs> the very word science is best avoided, we were told, because ordinary people see it as threatening. Well, I have little doubt that such dumbing down will be successful if your aim is to maximize the total population count at your event. But when I protest that what is being marketed here is not science at all, I'm rebuked for my elitism and told that luring people in by any means is a necessary first step. Well, horrible as the word is, maybe elitism 
is not such a terrible thing. In any case, there's a great difference between an exclusive elitism and an elitism that strives to help people to raise their game and swell the elite. A calculated dumbing down is the worst of both worlds, condescending and patronizing. I worry that to promote science as all fun and larky is to store up trouble for the future. Real science can be hard. Well, challenging might be a, um, a more positive word to use. Hard and challenging, but like classical literature or playing the violin, worth the struggle. If children are lured into science or any other worthwhile occupation by the promise of easy fun, what are they going to do when they finally have to confront the reality? Recruiting advertisements for the army rightly don't promise a picnic. They seek young people who are dedicated enough or insane enough to stand the pace. Fun sends the wrong signals and might attract people to science for the wrong reasons. Literary studies are in danger of be becoming similarly undermined as idle students are seduced into cultural studies with promised deconstruction of tabloid princesses and soap operas. Like proper literary studies, science can be hard and challenging, but also, like proper literary studies, wonderful. We shouldn't need wacky personalities and fun explosions to persuade us of the value of a life spent finding out why we have life in the first place. Worst of all, the dumbing down of science to court popularity defiles the wonder and risks turning off the very people best qualified to appreciate it and inspire others, real poets and true scholars of literature and the arts. The true poetry of science, especially 20th century science, inspired the late Carl Sagan to the following moving words written shortly before his death. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead, they say, no, 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 my God is a little God, and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe, as revealed by modern science, might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe, hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Well, given a hundred clones of Carl Sagan, we might have some hope for the next century. Meanwhile, in its closing years, the 20th century must be rated a disappointment as far as public understanding of science goes, while at the same time being a spectacular and unprecedented success with respect to scientific achievements themselves. Let's let our sensibility play over the 20th century of science. Can we discern one particular theme, leitmotif? Perhaps it would not be too inaccurate to call it the digital century. And I'm not emphatically just talking about computers or electronics. There's a sense in which the theme of digitalness or discontinuity unites the biology and the physics of the 20th century, as well as, more obviously, the engineering. The opposite of digital is analog. When the Spanish Armada was expected, a signaling system was established in England to give the warning. And what happened was that they built bonfires on the tops of hills. And each bonfire was in sight of the, of the next one. And so when the Spanish arrived, the idea was the first person to spot them was to light his bonfire, and the next one would see the bonfire light that. And a wave of bonfires would spread over the country very quickly to carry the news of the uh, Spanish invasion. I don't know whether the system worked, but in principle it obviously could have done. But now suppose we wanted to adapt the bonfire telegraph to convey a bit more information. Suppose we wanted it to convey the information about how big the Spanish fleet had been. 
Well, this would be an analog code. You could build a really big bonfire if the fleet was a very large one, and a little tiny bonfire if it was small, and have a graded series of bonfires in between. Well, that in principle would work. That's an analog code, but you can see that in practice it wouldn't work because there would be error at every stage of the transmission for various reasons. And by the time the message reached the other end of the country, nothing would be left of the original intended message. But now let's think about a different code, a digital code. Never mind the size of the fire. Build every fire as big as you like. But put a screen in front of it. And then when you want to make the message, lift the screen and lower it again. Lift the screen and lower it again. And send out discrete flashes like a lighthouse. Now, the number of flashes in a train of flashes can be used to encode the size of the armada. And that, you can immediately see, is far less subject to error than the original analog code. If, if there are eight flashes, each observer counts eight flashes, passes on eight flashes to the next one, and so on. That digital code has huge virtues over the previous analog code. And we could do even better. The, the Morse code was not invented until the 19th century, but there was nothing in Elizabethan technology to make it impossible to invent in Elizabethan times. And if they'd invented something like the Morse code, then you could have sent any message you like, the color of the admiral's beard or anything. Now, our understanding of the power of digital codes is very much a 20th century matter. And it's been made finally clear by electronics and computer engineers. But computer engineers were anticipated by two branches of biology, genetics and neuroscience. Nerves work a bit like armada beacons. They fire. What travels along a nerve fiber is not an electric current, however. It's more like a trail of gunpowder fizzing along the ground. The late W.A.H. Rushton of Cambridge University pointed out that a nerve cell, because of the, the way it works, effectively needs an amplifier about every millimeter or so. So a nerve cell that runs from spinal cord to the tip of your finger would need about 800 amplifiers, amplifying stations, boosting the signal as it goes along. And that's what you've got. They're called nodes of Ranvier. If the signal is to be preserved, every boosting station must take whatever signal it receives and restore it to its original higher value, not too high and not too low. That's what fidelity in an amplifier means. But there's bound to be a certain amount of error. There are just two or three boosting stations, as in a transcontinental telephone line, or as in, say, just three bonfires signaling the Spanish Armada. It might just about work. But in our nerve fiber, we're talking about 800 boosting stations. And there's not the slightest doubt that at the end of 800 amplifying stations, not a trace of the original information would survive. Well, it's long been known that nerve cells don't actually use a purely analog code. Rushton's calculation shows that they couldn't. Nerve impulses are trains of spikes. The height of the spike is irrelevant. It's the number of spikes, the rate of spikes, the patterning of spikes in time that carries the information. While nerve cells carry information about the world as it is, genes could be said to carry information about the remote past. This is an insight that follows from the so-called selfish gene view of evolution. The DNA inside each one of us is an ancient book of the dead. Superficially, the book written in DNA code seems to be about how to build a body, and indeed it is. But a deeper sensibility sees it as a description of ancestral worlds. The living organisms that we see are beautifully built to survive and reproduce in their environments. Well, that's what we Darwinians usually say. But actually, it's not quite right. Living organisms are beautifully built for survival in their ancestors' environments. And only if their ancestors' environments resemble their own do they really work well. 
It's because their ancestors survived long enough to pass on the DNA that our modern animals are well built. They're built from the very same instructions as caused the ancestors to succeed. The genes that survive down the generations add up, in effect, to a coded description of the range of environments in which the species and its ancestors have survived. And if it were not, the animals would not be fitted to survive. So each individual and its DNA can be regarded as a decodable model or description of the ancestor's environment, a genetic book of the dead. Not surprisingly, then, genes are digital. Theoretically, they could have carried their information in an analog code. Maybe on some distant planet they do, though I doubt it. But an ancient book written in analog language would degrade to meaninglessness in a very few generations. Before the invention of printing, ancient books like the Hebrew Bible were solemnly copied out by scribes, striving their utmost to retain accuracy. All human writing is digital, at least in the sense that we care about here, even as in the case of Chinese writing, where you have picture characters. They're drawn from a finite list of pictures. When there's an alphabet, the code is more clearly digital in our sense. Like any digital code, human writing is self-normalizing. If the Hebrew scribes had used an analog code, their ancient wisdom would have disappeared in three or four generations. And the same is true of the genetic books of ancestral wisdom that we all carry around inside us. Genes are digital. The understanding that genes are digital actually dates back to the 19th century. But Gregor Mendel was way ahead of his time, and his work was ignored until the early 20th century. It was Mendel's good fortune, his posthumous good fortune, that the rediscoverers of his principle gave him credit, rather than trying to claim it for themselves. It's well known that the only serious error in Charles Darwin's thinking about evolution was his genetics. He embraced the conventional wisdom of his time that inheritance is a blending process. In 20th century parlance, we'd say that Darwin assumed that genetics was analog. Analog genetics is like mixing paints. If the mother contributes the equivalent of red paint and the father contributes the equivalent of blue paint, the child will come out purple. And if the child then mates with another purple individual, nothing on earth is going to reconstitute the original red and blue variation. The awkward implication was pointed out in Darwin's time and gave him a lot of grief. Where was the variation for natural selection to work upon? Sir Ronald Fisher, whom I would nominate as Darwin's greatest 20th century successor, put the point with his usual precision. The important consequence of the blending is that the heritable variance is approximately halved in each generation. If variation is to be used by the human breeder or by natural selection, it must be snapped up at once, soon after the mutation has appeared and before it has had time to die away. Fisher went on to point out that 20th century genetics, Mendelian genetics, does not suffer from that problem because it's digital, although Fisher didn't use the word. Genes are all or none. A gene is either present or absent. Each gene in me came either from my mother or my father, and therefore from one and only one of my four grandparents, from one and only one of my eight great-grandparents. They don't merge and blend. The consequence, as Fisher and his colleagues of the neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 1930s and 40s realized, was that there is no automatic die-away of variation. No special measures are needed to maintain it. What we now call mutation rates can be extremely low, as indeed we know they are, and still be enough to top up the variation and give enough for natural selection 
to work upon. But when it comes to understanding the full digital nature of genetics, Fisher and his colleagues of the synthesis didn't know the half of it. Watson and Crick, in 1953, opened floodgates to what has been, by any standards, a spectacular intellectual revolution. Even if Sir Peter Medawa was going too far when he wrote in his review of Watson's The Double Helix, it is simply not worth arguing with anyone so obtuse as not to realize that this complex of discoveries is the greatest achievement of science in the 20th century. Now that's going too far. Um, my misgiving arises not because of Medawa's endearing arrogance, <laughs> but because I could easily imagine someone saying the same thing of, say, quantum theory or relativity. And I don't see how we'd settle the, the argument, at least by scientific means. It's a subjective judgment, a value judgment, uh, of science and sensibility. And I'm sure that Medawa, if he were here, would give a spirited defense of it. Watson and Crick's revolution was a digital revolution in the fullest possible sense, and it's gathered pace ever since. You can read a gene today, write out its exact coded sequence on a piece of paper, put that piece of paper in a library, and then get it out again in 2,000 years' time. Write the message back into an animal or plant, and it'll work. When the Human Genome Project is completed, probably uh, around the year 2003, by current estimates, it will be possible to write the entire human genome on two standard compact disks with enough capacity left over for a large textbook of molecular embryology. Send the box set of two CDs out into space, and the human race can go extinct happy in the knowledge that there is now a sporting chance that at some future time <laughs> an alien civilization will reconstruct a living human being. Well, at least my speculation is more plausible than Jurassic Park, which I think is a brilliant speculation. <laughs> and both speculations rest upon the digital accuracy of DNA. It's because of the digital revolution that the following kind of sentiment that was expressed by biologists in the 1930s is completely blown out of the water. I'm going to read an amazing quotation from Charles Singer, uh, a distinguished historian of biology, written in 1931. Despite interpretations to the contrary, the theory of the gene is not a mechanist theory. The gene is no more comprehensible as a chemical or physical entity than is the cell, or for that matter, the organism itself. Atoms exist independently, and their properties as such can be examined. They can even be isolated, not so the gene. The doctrine of the relativity of functions is as true for the gene as it is for any of the organs of the body. They exist and function only in relation to other organs. Thus. The last of the biological theories leaves us where the first started, in the presence of a power called life or psyche. Watson and Crick and their followers have utterly destroyed that kind of thinking. Now, of course, digital theory has been most fully worked out, not by neurobiologists or geneticists, but by electronic engineers. The digital telephones, televisions, music reproducers, microwave beams of the late 20th century and I'm sure the early 21st are incomparably faster and more accurate than the analog equivalents that they replace. I don't have to tell you in Seattle that digital computers are the crowning achievement of this age and they're also heavily implicated in all of technology. The late Christopher Evans summed up the speed of 20th century digital revolution with an analogy to the car industry. I quote, today's car differs from those of the immediate post-war years on a number of counts. It is cheaper, 
allowing for the ravages of inflation, and it's more economical and efficient. But suppose for a moment that the automobile industry had developed at the same rate as computers and over the same period. How much cheaper and more efficient would the current models be? If you've not already heard the analogy, the answer is shattering. Today, you would be able to buy a Rolls Royce for £1.35. <laughs> it would do three million miles to the gallon, <laughs> and it would deliver enough power to drive the Queen Elizabeth II. And if you were interested in miniaturization, you could place half a dozen of them on a pinhead. As you know, this is expressed in Moore's law, that computer power doubles every 18 months. It is the computer industry that's caused us to notice that the 20th century is the digital century, and led me to make the analogy with genetics and neurobiology and physics. This is where I get onto unfamiliar territory, but my small understanding of quantum theory suggests that at the most fundamental level of all, there is a deep grain, a deep discontinuity, which could be called digital. The Scottish chemist Graham Cairn Smith tells how he was first exposed to it. He says, I suppose I was about eight when my father told me that nobody knew what electricity was. I went to school the next day, I remember, and made this information generally available to my friends. <laughs> it did not create the kind of sensation I had been banking on, although it caught the attention of one whose father worked at the local power station. His father actually made electricity, so obviously he would know what it was. My friend promised to ask and report back. Well, eventually he did, and I cannot say I was much impressed. We sandy stuff, he said, rubbing his thumb and forefinger together to emphasize just how tiny the grains were. He seemed unable to elaborate further. <laughs> the tiny grains of the universe are quanta. The experimental predictions of quantum theory are upheld to the tenth place of decimals. The late Richard Feynman, who, after Einstein, has become one of the icons of 20th century physics, pointed out that accuracy of this order was equivalent to knowing the distance from New York to Los Angeles to an accuracy of the width of one human hair. It would seem that a theory that yields such accurate predictions, however baffling to the human mind, must in some sense be right. And the theory is, of course, quantum theory. And its experimental success, however much difficulty we find in understanding us, encourages us to believe that, at some fundamental level, the universe is deeply digital. Although I've included this for completeness in my list of digital sciences, there is one profound difference. The, the resemblance may be pu a purely poetic one, because in all the other cases, digitalness is an aid to communication. It's doing some kind of a purpose, obviously in the case of computers, slightly less obviously in the case of nerves and genes. But in all those cases, we can say that, that the digitalness is doing something useful for a purpose. The nature of matter, energy, and the universe is obviously different from that. There is no purpose in the universe at large. Charles Darwin's life spanned most of the 19th century. He died with every right to be satisfied that he had cured humanity of its greatest and grandest illusion. Darwin brought life itself within the pale of the explicable. No longer a baffling mystery demanding a supernatural explanation, life, the complexity and elegance that defines life, grows and gradually emerges by easily understood rules from simple beginnings. Darwin's legacy to the 20th century was to demystify the greatest mystery of all. Would Darwin be pleased with our stewardship of that legacy and with what we are now in a position to pass on to the 21st century? I think that he'd feel an odd mixture of exhilaration and exasperation. 
exhilaration at the detail and the comprehensiveness of understanding that science can now offer, exasperation at the superstition, the boneheaded, incurious love of mystery that still persists. Late 20th century civilization, Darwin would be dismayed to note, though imbued and surrounded by the products and advantages of science, has yet to absorb science into its sensibility. In a way, nothing has changed since the 20th century began. Darwin's co-discoverer of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, a younger man whose old age persisted well into the 20th century, he was a likable man, self-effacing enough to coin the word Darwinism. In some respects, he said of himself that he was more Darwinian than Darwin. But in one respect, Wallace disappointed his senior colleague. When it came to the human mind, Wallace's nerve failed him. He thought that this was the one part of life which Darwinism could not explain. And there was worse to come. The turn of the century saw a great flowering of spiritualism, of mediums exuding ectoplasm from every orifice, <laughs> preying on the desperate gullibility of the bereaved, purporting to put them in touch with their lost loved ones. Wallace fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Much earlier, in a friendly letter to Wallace, Darwin had written, I hope you have not murdered too completely your own and my child. Darwin was referring to a review which Wallace uh, had written, attempting to detach the human spirit from the Darwinian canon. And Wallace had written in more jocular vein, really, what with the Tories passing radical reform bills and the church periodicals advocating Darwinianism, the millennium must be at hand. So if Darwin and Wallace were to come back today, they might, as I say, conclude that nothing much has changed. Having marveled, as they certainly would, at the phenomenon of television, they would then look at what actually appears on television. <laughs> and they would see the X-Files, strange but true, the paranormal world of somebody whose name I'm not going to advertise. Well, we have to admit that the turn of the last century also saw a complacency about 19th century science. Wallace himself wrote a book called The Wonderful Century, extolling the brilliance of 19th century science. And we must strive not to emulate that complacency today in knocking the paranormal, as I now propose to do. William Thompson, first Lord Kelvin, President of the Royal Society, pioneered the transatlantic cable and also the second law of thermodynamics, C.P. Snow's litmus of scientific sensibility. Kelvin is credited with the following three confident predictions. Radio has no future. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Kelvin also, incidentally, gave Darwin a lot of grief by proving, using all the prestige of the senior science of physics, that the sun, and therefore the, the world, the earth, was too young to have allowed time for evolution. Kelvin was wrong by some three powers of 10, but poor Darwin didn't have the resources to answer him. So in attacking millenarial superstition, I must Avoid Kelvinian complacency. Of course, there's much that we still don't know. Part of our legacy to the 21st century is unanswered questions. Some of them are very big questions. The science of any age must prepare to be superseded. It would be too easy to, compl to complacently claim that our present scientific knowledge is all there is to know. And that we can be sure, for example, that astrology and psychics are rubbish without further discussion, simply because we can't explain them. Things that in the 20th century are commonplace, television, computers, jet planes, would have seemed in the last century 
very surprising indeed. As Arthur C. Clarke, the distinguished science fiction writer and science writer, has said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And he called that Clarke's third law. Maybe in some future time, physicists will understand gravity enough to build an anti-gravity machine. Levitation will become as commonplace to our descendants as jet planes are to us. So does Clark's third law entitle us to believe any and every yarn that folk may spin about apparent miracles? If a man claims to have witnessed a magic carpet zooming over the minarets, should we swallow his story on the grounds that those of our ancestors who would have doubted the possibility of radio would have turned out to be wrong? Of course not. Clark's third law does not work in reverse. Given that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, it does not follow that any magical claim that anybody may make at any time is indistinguishable from a technological advance that will come about at some time in the future. Of course, there have been occasions when authoritative skeptics have come away with egg on their pontificating faces. But a far greater number of magical and supernatural claims have been made and never vindicated. A few things that would surprise us today will come true in the future, but lots and lots of things that would surprise us today will not come true in the future ever. History suggests that the very surprising things that do come true are in a minority. And the trick is to sort them out from the rubbish. So we can never be sure that some reported claim is false. It may be that you really did fly on a magic carpet. I like to take my stand with David Hume on miracles. Hume said, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. Now, I'll follow through Hume's meaning with respect to one of the best attested miracles of all time, one that happened quite recently, uh, witnessed by 70,000 people, and I'm referring to the miracle of Our Lady of Fatima in 1917. What is reported is that before an audience of 70,000 people, uh, a young visionary, Lucia dos Santos, was speaking to the Virgin Mary who appeared, and as the Virgin Mary left, the sun suddenly, I quote from Father Edward Carter, there was a gasp of terror from the crowd, for the sun seemed to tear itself from the heavens and come crashing down upon the horrified multitude. Just when it seemed that the ball of fire would fall upon and destroy them, the miracle ceased, and the sun resumed its normal place in the sky, shining forth as peacefully as ever. Well, if the miracle of the moving sun had been seen only by Lucia, the young woman responsible for the cult of Fatima in the first place, we probably wouldn't take it very seriously. It's those 70,000 witnesses that carry conviction. Could 70,000 people simultaneously be the victims of a hallucination? Could they be simultaneously lying, colluding in a lie? Well, it doesn't seem probable, but on the other hand, Let's supply Hume's criterion. It's even less probable that the sun really did move. The sun hanging over Fatima was not, after all, a kind of private Portuguese sun. It was the same sun that was illuminating the whole of that hemisphere. Why didn't the rest of the world see it? If the Earth had moved with sufficient force to create the impression that the sun was moving, then everybody would have been subject to an earthquake so violent as to have crushed the breath out of their body. Or indeed, if the sun had really moved like that, it would have jolted itself out of the solar system. Have we any alternative but to follow Hume and choose the less miraculous of the two alternatives and conclude, contrary to official Vatican doctrine, that the miracle of Fatima never happened? Of course it's right that at the end of the 20th century we should show the humility 
that Kelvin at the end of the 19th failed to show. But it's also right to give due acknowledgement to all that we have learned during the 20th century. The digital century was the best that I could do to come up with one theme to talk about, but it doesn't do justice to, of course, to the achievements of the 20th century. We now know, as Darwin and Kelvin didn't, how old the world is, about 4.5 billion years. The shape of geography has not always been the same. The continents have drifted about in ways that we know in great detail. South America not only looks as if it might jigsaw neatly in under the bulge of Africa, it once did exactly that. Morocco once nestled into the eastern seaboard of North America. Madagascar once touched Africa on one side and India on the other. That was before India set off across what is now the Indian Ocean and crashed into China to raise the Himalayas. The map of the world's continents has a time dimension. And we, who are privileged to live in the 20th century, know exactly how it changed and why over the millions of years. We know roughly how old the universe is. Indeed, we know that it has an age, which is the same as the age of time itself, between 10 and 20 billion years. Having begun as a singularity with huge mass and temperature and very small volume, the universe has been expanding ever since. The matter in the cosmos is not homogeneous, but is gathered into some 100 billion galaxies, each containing an average of 100 billion stars. We can read the composition of any star in some detail by analyzing the spectrum of its light. Among the stars, our sun is a rather ordinary one, and it's unremarkable too, probably, in having planets in orbit. There's no direct evidence that any other planet houses life. If they do, such islands of life may be so scattered as to make it unlikely that any one will ever encounter any other. We understand in some detail the principles underlying the evolution of our own island of life. It's a fair bet, I'm prepared to bet, that the fundamental principle of life on this planet, Darwinian natural selection, will be in various modified forms the underlying principle of any other form of life in the universe. We know that our kind of life is built of cells, where a cell is either a bacterium or a colony of bacteria. The detailed mechanics of our kind of life depend upon the near infinite variety of shapes that can be assumed by a special class of molecule, the proteins. We know that those three-dimensional shapes are specified by a one-dimensional digital code, the genetic code, carried by DNA molecules inherited over many generations. We understand that there are a very large number of different species, although we don't know exactly how many. We cannot predict in detail how evolution will go in the future, but we can predict the general patterns that are to be expected. Among the unsolved problems that we shall bequeath to the 21st century, the outstanding one for my money is that of how the human brain works, especially the problem of subjective consciousness. The last few years of this century have seen a flurry of big guns taking aim at that problem, including Francis Crick himself, no less, Daniel Dennett, Stephen Pinker, Sir Roger Penrose. It's a big, deep problem worthy of minds like those. Obviously, I have no solution to the riddle of consciousness. If I had, I'd get a Nobel Prize. It isn't even clear what kind of problem it is, and it's therefore not clear what kind of a brilliant idea might be needed to solve it. But before Darwin solved the riddle of life's provenance in the last century, I don't think anybody had clearly posed the problem. It was only after Darwin had solved it that most people realized what the problem had been in the first place. I'll leave you with a final thought. If, as I hope, the 21st century cracks the problem of the human mind, there may be an additional byproduct. Our successors 
may then be in a position to understand the paradox of 20th century science. On the one hand, the 20th century ended with approximately the same level of supernatural superstition as the 19th. While on the other hand, the 20th century arguably added as much new knowledge to the human store as all previous centuries put together. I, for one, look forward eagerly to the 21st century and what it may teach us. Thank you very much.